Hello, I'm Josh Baer, and welcome to the Bear Facts Podcast. One morning in late October of last year, I woke up to a flood of messages and email alerts. Takashi Murakami listened to the Bear Facts Podcast and wrote about it on social media. Intrigued, I immediately logged on to read his brief but heartfelt open letter addressed to Jeff Poe, our guest on that episode which had just been released a few days earlier. This particular episode was significant as it marked Jeff's first interview after announcing his departure from the gallery he co-founded nearly 30 years ago. And among the many artists he collaborated with throughout his career, Murakami stands out as one of the most prominent. In his letter, Takashi wrote, Dear Mr. Jeff Poe, I listened to your podcast yesterday. I was glad to hear your voice, which I remember fondly. The content of the podcast was very interesting and undoubtedly refreshing for young artists and gallerists to hear. Today, the art industry feels like a luxury business. It's all about sales, sales, and more sales. I know, I shouldn't talk. It's nostalgic to think back to when you started the gallery, when people would engage with galleries asking, what is art? as they thoughtfully consider their purchases. Hearing you say it's still possible to create such an environment today truly spoke to my heart. After reading Takashi Murakami's moving words, we knew we had to invite him to the show. Now, after months of coordination between both of our teams, we finally made it happen. We are thrilled to share this conversation with you today. This episode is brought to you by Arthur Analytics, your single pane of glass for following the art world. It's kind of like sort of a digital Swiss army knife for art collecting, combining powerful tools and data with an easy to use interface. It's available on the web or on your phone. I've been testing it out over the last couple of weeks as I've been traveling around the world, tracking artists and ongoing sales from hotel rooms in Hong Kong and flights to LA. They provided our listeners with a free trial, no commitment required, at arthuranalytics.com slash barefax. Check it out after this episode. So the Barefax podcast would like to welcome one of my favorite and one of the world's greatest artists, Takashi Murakami, who is coming to us on this podcast. He's in Kyoto and I'm in Seoul. And it's interesting that we're having this today because two days ago in Seoul, I was standing in front of a painting of yours, Takashi, and with a client of mine. And I said to him, it's really interesting how Takashi can both be a very commercial artist, but also an incredibly important and creative artist at the same time, that both things can be true at once. And that evening, I found out you were doing our podcast almost a day later. So it was an interesting coincidence. So that multifaceted commercial yet artist work play important. Can you comment on that at some point? For example, the Pharrell Williams, he came to the creative world. He was a musician, but now he's making for the auction. And also the, he is a movie producer and he is a chief director to the Louis Vuitton. It's kind of the, you know, creator can be able to, you know, can play for the multiple uh, something. So it's kind of the, you know, my generation started to the, looks like that, you know, doing for the multiple something. So maybe like a Damian, me and Jeff Koons. That generation starting for the, it's kind of that, like a, you know, movement. So that means like, uh, you know, this is a quite normal. Do you find that there's sometimes pushback from people because of your success in sales that they don't take your work as seriously as it might, or is that not a problem? I cannot control because a market is a market. Market is a very organic. So many, you know, art people, to want to be created for the artificial something, but I cannot control. 
That means like if the market or audience is thrown out to you know my pieces or my images, my brand, this is you know end of the, my career. That that's okay. I saw your show at the MCA in Chicago in 2017, and it really showed your development and passion as a painter, going back to your early work. Can you comment on that a little bit? Because to my mind, it really shows the depth of what your work is actually about. Okay, so my standing position in, uh, you know, uh, how can I say, my career is mostly the painter. So, for example, if I'm making for the sculpture, you know, each time to the lose the money, this is not business. It's kind of the, my desire. For example, for our kind of the parents, the big, you know, 10 meter high, the big sculpture, lose the money. But, uh, you know, this is uh, my obsession to making for the, you know, these sculptures, but uh, it's still very expensive. So how can we making for these production costs came from the, my paintings to sales? That mean like, uh, you know, I have to keep uh, my career in uh, you know, painter. But the history of painting within Japan, I think is an important part as a Westerner to try to understand and seeing your early work as well. Do you think your work is perceived differently in the East than in the West in terms of the content? Uh, I don't know. I've been, you know, uh, long in, came from the New York and the West uh, art method. And uh, anytime very carefully to, you know, how can I say, keeping for the distance. So from, I am, came from the East. So I don't know. But, uh, you know, one thing is a very important thing is the uh, art market. These 20 years, the Chinese market is open. Also, the, yeah, like uh, Qatar and the Saudi, you know, this area also opened the, you know, the art market. That means like a uh, kind of the taste is uh, quite different from the West. That's why, you know, my standing position is much like a simple to fit with uh, kind of the you know, East world. Do you think your work means the same thing in Saudi Arabia that it means in Japan? Oh, no, I don't think so. Japan, you knew. So Japan doesn't have a contemporary art market, nothing. Let me ask you about the art market in an interesting way. About a year ago, we did a podcast with Jeff Poe, who you've worked with for a very long time. That thing is, uh, you know, very impressive. I wrote uh, Jeff Paul to the very personal, you know, letter. Yes, and we saw some posting about. Oh yeah, yeah. So I th don't. That made us interested in talking to you. We... Yeah, because I don't have any address. <laughs> That's why. What can you tell us a little bit of what you thought about that? Yeah, it's kind of the he left the Brahman Paul Gallery. I really understand for the, this feeling like uh, he was very tired, you know. So because uh, it's a gallery to gallery is anytime to the competitive. But uh, maybe like our generation started a career when we were very young with Brahman Po. We were not thinking about the competition with a gallery to gallery. Just uh, we want to offering to the public, to the, our you know, concept or our new you know, mood or new movement. But uh, now is uh, sometime, you know, big money to have to move in. So that is uh, very far away from the, you know, starting point. That's why. So I was very moved to the, his very honest uh, kind of the move. That's why. It's been our most popular uh, podcast, I think, in some ways. Are you still in touch with him now that you're not commercially involved with him? Oh, uh, no, uh, at the moment, <laughs> just, you know, two times to pack and horse in an email and, uh, you know, Instagram. After the break, we'll hear from Takashi on his relationship to pop culture and luxury, the difficulties Asian artists face in prospering in the West, and how the lasting impacts of World War II have influenced Japan's contemporary culture. BitGo is the leading infrastructure provider of digital asset solutions, offering custody, wallets, staking, trading, financing, and more. 
BitGo is the preferred security and operational backbone for more than 1,500 institutional clients in 50 countries. For more information, please visit www.bitgo.com. Now, I wanted to ask you about your relationship to pop culture and luxury goods, how you've worked with Louis Vuitton, Billie Eilish, and all these things. Everything is a coincidence, so I have no idea. But uh, one thing is uh, very important, the East people to survive in a contemporary art world in the West is super difficult. For example, the American artist is anytime I'm thinking about, uh, you know, much easier than me, like uh, double scale easier. So like a Japanese artist, mostly the Japanese artists have to, you know, using for the many trick in a conceptually and, uh, you know, kind of the approach to the public. So that's why I knew when I was debut and I decided to the Western world in a contemporary art scene. That's why I have to do so many other things <laughs> to the uh, main thing in the art world, like um, making a painting, making a sculpture, making an installation, making a you know, video. You know, we have to do, I have to do. But at the same time, I have to do other things. So this additional thing is uh, my kind of the, you know, brand or I don't know, survival way, it's an item. Why do you think it's more difficult for Japanese, or I would say Asian artists to prosper in the West? That was my feeling. Yes, I understand. I don't disagree, but I'm just curious why. Okay. So for example, like a Japanese manga culture, the American artist very difficult to debut. So it looks like that. Same thing. It's kind of the culture is uh, contemporary art is a uh, main thing is in, uh, you know, West world. That means like uh, American New York art scene is, uh, you know, kind of the very uh, kind <laughs> to like me and like, uh, you know, Eastern artist. But because, uh, you know, manga world, very difficult to debut without Japanese people. A few like a Taiwanese, Chinese, Korean artist is already debut, but uh, no Western manga artist yet. So that is, it looks like that. I would say it's very hard to understand thousands of years of your culture coming in as an American for a week here, a week there. And that's it's kind of like we're starting in different places, but we're all in the world together. Does that make sense a little bit of why it's difficult? Totally agree. But uh, Japan is already very you know, huge influence from the U.S., that means like uh, Japanese people don't remember to the Japanese history, by the way. Well, it's not that long ago that we had some very strong history there. And I know that was a major part of your work is this relationship between the U.S. and Japan from the 40s. It's like it's a critical part of your work, isn't it? In Japan, the very big controversy about uh, Oppenheimer, the movie. Chris Nolan, the director, is a very popular, you know, movie industry in Japan, but, you know, same time to the, from the public, so very sensitive. I don't understand to the, you know, why the Japanese people just this time is uh, very sensitive, but, you know, same time to the cannot be hit in Japan too, this movie. But when I saw the Oppenheimer in San Francisco, I was very surprising because there are so many U.S. people to watching that. And also that this movie is a super difficult, super poetic thing. But, uh, you know, how the U.S. Uh, movie audience enjoying for this movie is, I was so surprised. It's kind of the American people to you know, uh, very big proud about, uh, you know, so we have a very long history in uh, film industry, film culture, film grammar. And then these people to pushing for Chris Nolan, like a filmmaker, right? But at uh, the same time, to the, you know, still a uh, big influence came from the uh, World War II, like uh, we lose the uh, war. So that's why the Japanese people very strongly to you know, against the Oppenheimer movie. Well, I can understand that. 
After the break, we'll hear Takashi's ideas on the future of art, how the political intersects with the whimsical in his work, and what's next on the artist's fast-paced global schedule. Arthur Analytics is the only platform you need to master the art of collecting. Let's say you're interested in buying a Picasso, a good idea, but you're traveling on business in Seoul. Simply search Pablo Picasso, and within seconds you can see the latest news, sales, and trend data. Plus, with the Near Me map, which covers over 500 cities, you could step outside and go see the work for yourself. It's never been easier for collectors. For more information, head to arthuranalytics.com slash barefax. What do you see both for yourself and for the art world in the future? And um, how are you planning to address that? Uh, one thing is, uh, you know, when I met with uh, NFT art, that moment I was so surprised. And also the, I was thinking about, oh, this is a future art. Because no, you know, nothing, no, no things, no fact, just a digital image. And this image is a very low level or like, a, you know, data scale. And then people can trade to in uh, Ethereum. It's kind of the, you know, uh, human being can thinking about a very abstraction value. And then, you know, everything is a very abstraction. So that's why I was believed to the NFT art. And then I was, you know, go into this world. But now it looks like a destroy. And uh, no one to, you know, involvement to the, from the contemporary art artist, right? But uh, I, I am doing still. <laughs> and uh, I released this year and uh, quite good effect, quite good business. So... It's kind of the very abstraction uh, conceptual thing is in the market. For example, the cryptocurrency is uh, much bigger, maybe like uh, in the future, the bigger and bigger because, you know, across the borderline, like a kind of a freedom in the uh, worldwide. So this is uh, one of the, you know, future image when I was watching like uh, two, three years ago. But now my future image is when starting for the war stuff in the worldwide. It's kind of the, you know, I am watching how war is starting. So I don't know. It's kind of the, you know, two, three years ago, very optimistic image. But now is, uh, you know, just a fear for the, you know, the public people to move to the, you know, hysteric something. So, because uh, these two years in Japan has a uh, young generation people very interested to, into the political something. That movement is uh, very unique. When the Japanese young people to interested into the, you know, uh, the political thing, was uh, late 1960s until very early 1970s. It's kind of the, you know, over 50 years is nothing to do to the political something, but now is come back. And also the now is a very strongly come back to the left wing, uh, the people mentality. So I cannot thinking about uh, what is uh, art future. So just, uh, you know, what is reality, their life? Well, certainly with two months to go before the election in America, I think the world is waiting to see where we go for the rest of the world, certainly. But I've always seen your work as political. Maybe you don't like labels. Most artists don't. But I think there's been an undercurrent of a lot of political content in your work for more than 30 years. Do you accept that term? Mm, for example, it may be like uh, my kind of teacher is uh, Hayao Miyazaki, the animation director. So he was a uh, super hardcore left wing, but uh, he gave up in the uh, early 70s. And then he changed for the animation creator. So looks like that. <laughs> 
it's a gave up. So, you know, uh, for me, is uh, I gave up to thinking about uh, political something. But, you know, privately, I am thinking to the, a little bit the political something. That's why I'm making for the painting some, you know, very stupid message. But uh, I have uh, no dream to the, these, my pieces having a, making for the movement. Just the, you know, still now is, oh, hey, Takashi, I love you, a happy face. Hey, Takashi, your flower is beautiful. Looks like a, you know, childish artist I am. <laughs> well, I'd like to end on a comment and a question that relates to that in the sense that you've been quite open in the last year about your personal mental state of mind. And that's sort of the, you're talking a little bit about the happy Otakashi versus how you are as a person as well. And I don't know if there's some way you could tie that to how you feel about being an artist and what your message is for others. That openness that you've expressed for me has been quite unique and touching and important beyond just your work. And I'd like to thank you for for doing that. I'm sure it's not easy. Is there something that you would be willing to say about that? In the history, mostly the uh, I saw the one YouTube channel. So the Japanese, some art historian talking about uh, impressionist, you know, generation. So he knew the many storyline and this artist is, you know, very lovely for this model. And this model having uh, many boyfriends, blah, blah, blah. This artist having uh, some letter, blah, 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 very in detail. But, you know, the generally people and the museum audience doesn't know anything. Just in fact, the pieces, right? The impressionist Monet before the dying, you know, cannot see. That thing is uh, pretty normal, pretty direct to understanding for the audience. Oh, this artist is cannot see anything. <laughs> so th that is a very important, I think. Doesn't necessary to the, my, you know, kind of that detail in the Instagram or open something, the uh, social media. But uh, thank you so much to talking about that. But uh, looks like that. Maybe after pandemic, uh, in the pandemic mostly, many people to making for the disappointing everything. That's why, you know, just my message is... Uh, and not, not just you, like, uh, you know, many people thinking about the same thing. This is a kind of the, you know, world generation. But when I, you know, watching to this reaction in a comment, so same time to the, I was, you know, hearing, oh, thank you so much to the people, right? So, and then I can do to the, you know, wake up to the next day. Like uh, recently, this uh, two, three years after the pandemic, Maybe getting older, I am 62 years old, like a hormone balance is uh, quite unbalanced, maybe. That's why uh, the, my mental is, uh, you know, super wavy. So, and then I am writing uh, something like that, uh, some my like, kind of essay. So after that, I can make it for a praising, just, you know, for myself to make it for this stuff. But uh, thank you. What are you working on next? You're in Kyoto, big show. What is next for us to see from you? Oh, this is a very nice question. Because uh, last Sunday is done to the, my show. And uh, everybody to my team is, you know, like a thank you, everybody, and clapping. And uh, many media people ask me like that, like, what's the next? And uh, I have the feeling maybe you must be like a relax. Right? And then next day, next Monday, very early morning, Kanye West Sun, the manager, kind of message, I want to go to your studio. And then our team is, what? And then we have to take care about the whole stuff, waiting for whole day. And uh, he was not coming. Looks like that. 
<laughs> Looks like that. <laughs> Sounds like David Hammonds. Oh, is that? Would do something like that, a performance piece. Yeah, it's kind of, every day is, ah, uh, <laughs> you know, no plan. Like if I have a plan, so cannot produce a good way. Every day is confusing. Ah, <laughs> That's good. You never know what tomorrow will bring. <laughs> yeah. It keeps you young. Josh, so can I ask you? After the break, the tables are turned as Josh Bear gets placed in the hot seat, answering burning questions from Takashi on the state of the New York City art scene, what constitutes great art and how to see it, and recent takes from the Bear Facts newsletter. BitGo is the first digital asset company to focus exclusively on serving institutional clients. Founded in 2013, BitGo is the largest independent digital asset custodian in the world, securing approximately 20% of all on-chain Bitcoin transactions by value. For more information, please visit www.bitgo.com. Josh, so can I ask you? Yes. Okay. When I was uh, 25 years old, I was super, you know, that moment was uh, maybe like a simulationism. I was, you know, learning a lot of pieces, like a lot of artists. Sherry Rabin, you know, the Maya Beesman, like after the simulationism is uh, Donald Butcherer and uh, Donald Sultan. You know, so many artists is uh, in uh, uh, New York City, right? But uh, now what's going on in the uh, West or US or New York art movement? I was lost is uh, what, what is, uh, you know, maintained in uh, New York art scene. So could you teach me about uh, your impression? It's a great question. When I was in my early 20s in starting off in the New York art scene, it was a golden age of art and music. So you would go to a studio, a one-bedroom apartment, that's Jeff Koons. You'd go see something at Artist Space. The receptionist was Cindy Sherman. You'd go to the Mud Club and there's the Talking Heads. You'd go hop on a plane to Europe. Who's this guy Polka? Who's this guy Richter? It was a great moment. It was before the art market really took off. It was just sort of the artists, people could afford to work and live in New York and the writers, and the musicians, and the artists, and the poets, and the fashion, they were all together. And New York's been a bit of a victim of its own success, that it's too expensive for artists to be there, or they're just interested in making money. So it's spread out across the world. Does that make a little bit of sense? So what is, uh, you know, just sound, so you are maintained to the interest in the art world right now. It's what? My interest is in the great art. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I can answer what I mean. It's like, there's 3 million artists in America. I'm interested in Charles Ray and David Hammonds and Shireen Nishat. And the rest is kind of noise. And it's good, people survive and all that, and we talk about it. But ultimately, there's, you know, not that many great artists. And that's what, for me, that's what I'm interested in. Mm. And the same in music or film. We want to see the great things. Mm. Okay. By the way, I was starting to the, you know, hip hop group in Japan. You can see at the YouTube. <laughs> Okay, it's like searching. <laughs> there's always something there that's going to surprise us. Is <laughs> I appreciate your questions to us. Is there anything in closing out that you would like uh, our audiences to know about? Oh, okay. So you came to Korea, right? It's kind of the art fair. So how you are feeling right now? It's uh, you know you watching feeling me like uh, you are impression. It's, it's very young. It's very interested. Oh, I read uh, your article, Bear Facts. Yes. And um, I think that there's a huge future for the art market 
in a in a way that's less reliant on Gagosian, David Zwerner, and that people are really ready to be engaged. Mm. But we just need to engage them with better art. Oh, it's a kind of the environment is already set up, right? The environment is set up. Good. And it's going to be, it's time for the model to change. You've been changing the models as you've gone because probably had no choice, but that's who you are. Mm. And there, there is a future there that I'm not sure what it is, but it's actually much brighter than the media make it. Mm. Interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. So this has been really one of my favorite moments of our podcast. We've been at the Bear Facts leaning into not just talking to dealers, but talking to artists, because without the artist, there is no art world. So Takashi, we're honored to have you here. And um, I owe you a drink in New York or someplace, but I'm not too good at hip hop. So I'll let you... <laughs> Do that at the karaoke. Yo. <laughs> Yo, words of Takashi. A huge thank you to Takashi for coming on the show. And thank you to Arthur Analytics for sponsoring this episode of the Bear Facts Podcast. Their app is available on the web or on your mobile device. With more data and better features than the competition, Arthur Analytics is really the new must-have application. Okay, well, maybe Instagram is the best application, but and the bare facts, but they're all fun to scroll through for anyone who's serious about art collecting. You can try it out for yourself free, no commitment required at arthuranalytics.com slash bare facts. Thanks for listening to the Bear Facts podcast. Our host is Josh Bear. Our executive producer is Lu Yang Zhang. Our content strategist is Bo Liang Shen. And I'm Patrick Hill, our associate editor. Our audio editor for this episode is Anti Lane. Check back soon for future episodes as we unpack the inner workings of the global art industry through exclusive, candid interviews with key players in the business as they offer their perspectives on art and the market in the US, Asia, Europe, and beyond. <laughs>